Hi, I'm Christian Williams, and it's the 2019 holiday gift-giving season, and I, I recommend books. So this year, let's go over a few sailing novels. We've already treated uh, probably the best contemporary uh, novelist of our time, Patrick O'Brien, and I dare not even mention Moby Dick, the great piece of literature that confounds every attempt to compete with it, or even my own book, my own new novel, Rarotonga, which is just out a month ago. I'll put uh, those in the description and the links at the end of this video. But, you know, something has changed in the books that we read about sailing in the sea. Um, they're mostly nonfiction now. I think because the adventures that we follow today in the news and on television um, are quite different than they, than they were at the heyday of the imaginative story. We, everybody goes uh, off adventuring now with a GoPro camera. Uh, people are quite literate. They keep notes. Uh, in many cases they are sponsored. And the result is an almost endless stream of true adventure stories. But the nonfiction books that we read by the hundreds leave something out, and that is the imaginative capacity and capability of a novelist taking on the same subjects. And at the turn of the century, nearly 120 years ago, uh, this was the stock and trade of communication. And I have four to recommend. The first is Joseph Conrad's uh, Typhoon. And this, uh, this, provide, this, this book is Typhoon and Other Tales. It also includes several other good short stories. But the story Typhoon has always been a favorite of mine. It's about Captain McWhir, a rather stolid man, unimaginative, who is the captain of a pretty beat up freighter crossing the China Sea with a cargo of 200 Chinamen, yes, coolies. All four of these books were written about 1900 and they, they have the assumptions and attitudes of the time, which personally, as a reader, I accept as, uh, you know, it's their geist, their spirit of their time, and we can learn from it without imitating it. In any case, those uh, Chinamen present quite a problem to a ship at the height of a typhoon, and Conrad is uh, very clever about describing how this unimaginative captain uh, pulls through. There's a terrifying scene in it, at least for me. They think they've gone through the worst of the typhoon because the sun came out and the winds dropped down and Captain McWhir turns to his mate and says, the worst is yet to come, of course, on the other side of the anticyclone. Typhoon by Joseph Conrad. Another classic, which I was unfamiliar with until last year of the period, is uh, Erskine Childers' The Riddle of the Sands a record of secret service. For some reason, everybody read this book, had read this book, but me. Vibrant, impassioned, witty, intelligent, and shamelessly prejudiced in the manner of the day. Well, they're all like that. Um, I, I, I'm, I wasn't entirely persuaded by the spy aspect of the Riddle of the Sand by Erskine Childers. What I liked was something completely unfamiliar to me, which is that this story takes place in a 30-foot boat with bilge keels, you know, so that it can sit upright uh, when the tide goes out in an area of the world that our European friends probably uh, are very familiar with, but I'm not, and that is the, the, uh, the, the tidal sands off the great estuaries at about the intersection of Holland and Germany, just south of, well, what used to be called Schleswig-Holstein. I guess. They're, these big uh, rivers like the Elba uh, are estuaries and they go into the uh, North Atlantic there and form vast sandbanks that go out 10 miles offshore so that you can anchor 10 miles offshore off the Frisian Islands and when the tide goes out, as this book describes us, for as far as the eye can see, there are nothing but sandbanks. And you can navigate these channels by if you if you know just where they lay, which just might be important in wartime or so, uh, Carruthers and Davies, the heroic occupants of this this leaky 30-foot boat, uh, hope to discover uh, for their uh, 
Secret Service end. Well, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson is supposed to be a children's book, of course, uh, and uh, there are more children among us than we thought, if that's true, because I reread this last year uh, on a long car trip in which I was alone and was completely charmed once again. You know, this is the introduction to the world um, by Robert Louis Stevenson of Long John Silver, and the story is told through the eyes of young Jim. And he happens to come into possession of very important information about the treasure map. And here's how, here's how he does it, by falling into an apple barrel. I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left, but sitting there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was at the point of doing so when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there trembling and listening in the extreme of fear and curiosity. For from these dozen words, I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. Now, <laughs> ah, these guys knew how to tell a story. Uh, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, Captain's Courageous by Rudyard Kipling, um, another book written about in about 1900, uh, we've all heard of, but if you haven't reread it lately, it will bring a tear to your eye. Um, Captain's Courageous said, I don't have the book with me, uh, is as you probably recall the story of young Harvey, who's about 15, who falls off an ocean liner and is uh, rescued by a Gloucester fisherman skippered by one Disco Troop, one of the coolest guys in the history of the sailing literature. And, um, and here is the introduction to, here's the introduction to Harvey. He was dressed in a cherry-colored blazer, knickerbockers, red stockings, and bicycle shoes, with a red flannel cap at the back of his head. After whistling between his teeth as he eyed the company of men aboard the steamship, he said in a high, loud voice, Say, it's thick outside. You can hear them fish boats squawking all around us. Say, wouldn't it be great if we ran one down? <laughs> well, it is after that that he falls overboard into the clutches and the rescue of one of those Gloucester steamers. Uh, Captain's Courageous is a wonderful uh, book. It's also a sensationally good uh, movie uh, to the highest standards, uh, made by Victor Fleming, directed by Victor Fleming, with Spencer Tracy as Manuel. Um, and uh, it contains, uh, that is, uh, Captain's Courageous, the movie, uh, real footage of Gloucester fishing schooners in action on the Grand Banks, and especially of their, their race home uh, to Gloucester at the end of the story. Now, Nonfiction books still dominate, and um, I th I thought to bring along this year uh, four that I, that you might not have heard about, uh, and the first of these is uh, something I was introduced a book I was introduced to only five or six years ago by my friends in the Pacific Northwest called The Curve of Time by M. Wiley Blanchett or however she pronounces it written in 1927. Um, Blanchett is a woman who uh, moved to Vancouver, and her and they had a 25-foot motorboat, and her husband went off on it one day and never came back. He drowned. Nobody knows why. They had five children. Instead of selling the boat, which I think most people would do out of grief, she took her five children for the next 15 years, six of them on this boat, and live for months at a time in summers 
exploring British Columbia at, at, um, in the 1920s. Uh, she's a wonderful writer, evocative, not sentimental. And the things she puts her five children through, and they do it without complaint, are extraordinary. They're cold all the time. Their anchor often slips. They, uh, they go off hiking to visit hermits. They discuss with some alacrity and period sensibilities the Indians of the time. And uh, British Columbia has changed entirely since then. Um, and this book is a wonderful evocation of what it was like before civilization really got its grip. The Curve of Time, M. Wiley Blanchett. Of nonfiction books, curiously, uh, two years before the mast, very well known, but for some reason, a half dozen of my friends report reading this again within the last couple of years. It's by Richard Henry Dana, Jr., and as, as you recall, two years before the mass, is, uh, he, he was a college student at Harvard uh, at the time, uh, and I think he was diagnosed with bad eyesight, and they said, you need a sea voyage, young man. So he signed on before the mast on uh, a ship uh, that uh, collected uh, skins off of the California coast. And uh, it's true that the people I'm citing who've read it live in Southern California. Why? We don't know what work is today. These guys were unloading uh, seal skins you know, waist deep all winter, uh, working 12, 15 hours a day. And um, uh, as an insight into what it was like to go on a sailing ship uh, as your summer job uh, back then, uh, nothing beats uh, two years before the mass, and it's quite well written too. Uh, um. Rockwell Kent is a famous artist, as as you know, an illustrator, and this is a, a book of his uh, about his. Uh, it's called uh, North by East, and it's the story of his uh, yachting voyage to Greenland. Um, in this book is told the story of an actual voyage to Greenland in a small boat, of a shipwreck there, and of what, if anything, happened afterwards, some of which uh, may or may not have happened, not to knock Rockwell Kent's imagination, but this is supposed to be a first-hand account. Um, I cite it because uh, if you can find an edition uh, with his prints in it, and I, I think you, you can online, um, it's an, they're an extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to illustration, um, you can't beat Rockwell Kent. At 2.30 in the afternoon, we left our anchorage. We didn't sail out, we were towed. Tired of waiting for a wind, ashamed of inaction, embarrassed by abortive leave-takings, we wanted only to, to get out of it and off to sea. Rockwell Kent, the pictures alone are worth the price of admission. North by East. Well, here's a book I'll bet you haven't heard of, which has affected me greatly. It's called The Boy, Me, and the Cat by Henry M. Plummer. Well, my father gave me this, it says in February 1981. The cruise of the mascot, 1912 to 1913. The mascot is a, a small gaff-rigged cat boat that father and son, Henry M. Plummer and Henry M. Plummer Jr., sailed down the intercoastal waterway to Florida. It's written in a delightfully naive style. I think this book was lost for a long time until it, it's, it was recognized for what it is, which is a really good account with a cute, as it were, title, The Boy, Me, and the Cat. Um, the cat comes to it. Well, I won't tell you what happens to the cat. Scotty, I think, is his name. What I will tell you is why I can hardly read this book now uh, without uh, extreme emotion. Here's the dedication written, in, uh, written to a 13, 14-year-old boy. To my companion, Henry M. Plummer, Jr., who, with unfailing patience, bore with my fretful exactions, and was ever ready to lend a willing hand, who joined me in love for Scotty, and in grief at her death, that's the cat, to this boy who is my joy and my pride. <coughs> Henry M. Plummer, 
Well, <clears throat> all right. Let's try that again without the emotion. Uh, to this boy who was all. To this boy who is my joy and my pride, this log is lovingly dedicated by his father. Very nice. The boy, me and the cat. But some years later, when the book was rediscovered by publishers, the uh, the New Bedford, Massachusetts, of May 9th, 1928, reported the following. Mr. Plummer's son, Henry M. Plummer, Jr., who appears in this book, was an aviator in the Great World War, killed in action. When you read the book, you get to know these guys. On a lighter note, let's move our perspective worldwide. And from this very bunk here in this very harbor in Southern California, and that we will do, and this is a great gift for anyone who keeps talking about sailing around the world, Jimmy Cornell's World Cruising Roots. <laughs> this book, this book should not be allowed to exist because it tells you how to sail around the world and to anywhere you want to with the directions and even waypoints in the newest edition and I think that uh, I think that if you give this to somebody his wife's going to say George why are you reading that book about world cruising routes by Jimmy Cornell here's one route PS 106 Queensland to Papua New Guinea there are two main routes crossing the Coral Sea from Queensland to Papua New Guinea. One that goes direct to the capital port. No, no, no. We oughtn't to read that too often. Wanderlust gets going. And I think that now we've finished this essay of Christmas books. I shall go home and instead of sailing around the world, take a nap. Thanks for listening. <laughs>